Welcome to lecture 33. In this lecture we're going to be talking about the Rankine cycle. This is a new topic for us. We're, we're getting into the last material for the entire course. So between now and the end of the course we'll be focusing on different kinds of thermodynamic cycles that occur in practice. The first one we'll talk about is a what's called a vapor cycle. It's called the Rankine cycle. It's the one that's used in large power plants like a gas-fired or coal-fired or power plant, a nuclear power plant, uh, even uh, solar power plants. Power plants that use a working fluid like water, for example, that's turned into steam, which then goes into a turbine and so on and so forth. These typically operate on some version of what's known as a ranking cycle. You've seen this kind of cycle before in our previous lectures. We've referred to it many times, we just never really called it a ranking cycle. So the picture you have on the screen here is a schematic of a typical, very simple power plant using a Rankine cycle. So let's start here at the steam generator. This one's showing for a nuclear power plant, but you have a working fluid like water here. And in the boiler, it's sometimes known as a steam generator, a boiler, a vaporizer, goes by different names. But in that portion, heat is added to the fluid or energy is added to the fluid via heat transfer. Here it's done via a nuclear fuel. So you have nuclear fuel here. It heats up a working fluid here that's pumped around. And so this is very, very hot working fluid. Uh, exchanges energy with the water that's operating in our ranking cycle. So the water is our working fluid here. So the water goes from a liquid phase into a, a vapor phase. So it's turned into steam. And then that steam goes through a turbine or actually it goes through a set of turbines. And we'll talk about that in a different lecture, but it goes through a turbine where we extract some shaft work that powers a generator that gives us electricity. And then from that turbine, the low pressure steam goes into a condenser where it, it turns back into a liquid phase. So there's some heat removed here. So in this picture, you can see a cooling stream of water that will then help extract some of that energy from the fluid. This is typically connected to a cooling pond, a river, the ocean, something like that, where you have a large body of cold water. And then that liquid water goes through a pump, and then the cycle repeats. So we've done this sort of thing many times. We just never called it a ranking cycle. In the next lecture, what we'll do is we'll, we'll talk about improvements to the ranking cycle. So there'll be some variations to the ranking cycle that we'll look at that can increase the thermal efficiency of the power plant. But in this lecture, we'll just focus on the basic ranking cycle, keep it very simple. I came across this plot that I thought was interesting. This plot shows the thermal efficiency for various kinds of power cycles or engines, if you will, as a function of the power output that's typically associated with that kind of cycle. So you can see here at the very low end, you have a two-stroke gasoline engine. So they produce very small amounts of power and their thermal efficiency is quite low, only on the order of 15% or so. And then you can see as we increase the power output and thermal efficiency, we're headed this way. You can see for thermal power generation, like a ranking cycle, and nuclear power generation, they fall over here at the largest output. So we have on the order of a thousand megawatts way over here. Those typically have higher efficiency, somewhere on the order of about 33% or so up into the low 40s. And as we'll discuss in the next lecture, you can do things to the simple ranking cycle to improve its thermal efficiency. So that's how we get up into these 40% for thermal power generation. This is what we're looking at for this particular lecture. Let's get started. So here's a schematic of a typical ranking cycle. You've seen this many times. We have, again, the vaporizer, steam generator, boiler, whatever you want to call it, where some energy is had via heat transfer. Puts energy into the working fluid that then goes into a turbine where it expands and we extract some power. Then goes into a condenser where we offload some energy to the surroundings. And then we go through the pump and repeat the cycle. We have these states in here, one, two, three, four. The way we typically analyze these ranking cycles is we'll draw control volumes around individual components, just like we've done many times, and apply the first law to them. So for example, if we apply the first law to that control volume surrounding the turbine, we'd get that the power out of the turbine, m dot, would be equal to h1 minus h2. Neglecting heat transfer, neglecting kinetic and potential energy effects, and assuming steady state operation. We can do the same thing for each component. For example, we can draw a control volume around the pump. 
you could find the power going in. There would be H4 minus H3 times the mass flow rate. Do the same thing around the boiler. There you'd find the heat transfer coming in. That'd be M dot H1 minus H4. And then around the condenser, the Q dot out would be M dot H2 minus H3. So these are first law analyses applied to control volume surrounding each of the components. This should all be reviewed. There's nothing new here. The thermal efficiency of the entire power cycle, this again is something you've seen many times before. It'll be the net power out divided by the heat coming in into the boiler or vaporizer. It's the Q dot in coming in right here. Okay, But it's the net power out. And the reason we care about the net power out is because of course, obviously we're interested in a power cycle, how much power we're getting out, but we do have to put a little power back in to, to keep it cycling around. So it's the net power that we're interested in. Let me write that out. So the net power out is the power out minus the power in. And the denominator is still just Q dot in. So we could, of course, substitute in from our first law expressions over here and write it all in terms of specific enthalpies if you'd like. Nothing new in any of this. It's all just a, a review. The one thing that is a little bit new now is we've talked a bit about isentropic efficiencies for the turbine and the pump, for example. And so a lot of times we'll talk about, you know, we'll have this actual ranking cycle with turbines and pumps that have a certain isentropic efficiency. So if we're talking about isentropic efficiencies, one thing we might be interested in is what kind of power would we get out of this ranking cycle if we were operating with a turbine and pump that were operating at 100% isentropic efficiency. So no irreversibilities in the pump or turbine. So that's what we call an ideal ranking cycle. So this is what it looks like schematically. So in an ideal ranking cycle, a uh, process from 1 to 2S here, this is where the turbine is. And let me just make a note of that. So this is the, the turbine part. So for the turbine, what ends up happening is we, we're at a higher pressure. So I've drawn a, an isobar at this high pressure. So this pressure is greater than the pressure at, at P2 and the other points down here. So, so this is the high pressure part. State 1 typically in a ranking cycle, at least for the simple ranking cycle, state one is at a saturated vapor state. And you'll see in the next lecture that we don't have to stay there. So for example, in a ranking cycle with superheat, that's a, something we'll cover in the next lecture, state one is actually in the superheated vapor phase. But for this simple ranking cycle, we start right at a saturated vapor state. And then in an actual turbine, we drop down to this smaller pressure. So there's the isobar for that one. In the actual process, we have some irreversibility. So state two has a larger specific entropy than state one. So we go off to the right a little bit there. So that would be the actual case. In the ideal case, with 100% isentropic efficiency for the turbine, it drops straight down. So that's state 2s. So the ideal case is from 1 to 2s. The actual case is 1 to 2. So there's some efficiency associated with the turbine. Then from 2 or 2s to state 3, oh, and by the way, state 2 or state 2s, it's under the vapor dome here. So th this is a saturated liquid vapor mixture. We're changing phase from a saturated vapor to a um, saturated liquid vapor mixture. From 2s or 2 to 3, this is the condenser. Remember, condensers are a constant pressure process. So that we're staying on the same isobar. And we go all the way to a saturated liquid state at state 3. Let me just show remind you of the picture here. State 3 is leading into the pump. We typically want that pump to operate using just a liquid. So that's why we're at the saturated liquid state for state 3. And then as we go through the pump, in the real case, from state 3 to state 4, it's a compressed liquid and the entropy increases because the pump has some isentropic efficiency that's typically less than 100%. So state four would be here. It would be at a slightly higher specific entropy than state three. 
For the ideal case, where the pump has 100% isentropic efficiency, we go straight up because that's an isentropic process. So that gets us to 4S. Still a compressed liquid. Then from state 4S or 4 back to state 1, this is going through the, the boiler or vaporizer or steam generator. Then what we do is we follow an isobar because going through a boiler is a constant pressure process, so we stay on the same isobar. So we're in a compressed liquid state. We hit point A here, that's a saturated liquid. And then we continue along at constant pressure back to the saturated vapor state at state one, and then we repeat the loop. So you can see the ideal ranking cycle follows the solid black lines. And really the part that makes it ideal are these isentropic processes through the turbine and the pump. And then the actual ranking cycle, the one that has some irreversibility to it, it follows this kind of dash line, these dash lines for the turbine from one to two and for the pump from three to four. This is where the boiler is. This is where the condenser is. And this is where the pump is. Just on this plot. Again, I don't think there are any surprises here uh, since you've already done these sorts of things before in previous problems. But this is the TS diagram for an actual power plant, a very simple ranking cycle for a power plant. In the next lecture, we'll talk about some additional complexities that are used in, in practice. Just a few notes that I want to add here. First of all, the thermal efficiency of the power cycle increases as the average temperature at which heat is added to the boiler increases. This comes back to the idea of the thermal efficiency for a reversible power cycle. So an internally reversible power cycle. This is the best you're going to have. Recall that that looks something like this. The picture we have here is this is our hot reservoir. And this is at temperature TH. And put some heat into our system. This is our ranking cycle as our system. And then here's our cold reservoir at temperature TC, and there's their power out, the net power out. So if you go back several lectures and look at where we talked about thermal efficiencies for internally reversible cycles, so this is the ideal cycle, the best you're ever going to get is related to the temperature of our reservoirs, so 1 minus TC over TH. So if we it can increase the average temperature which heat is added in the boiler. So if we can increase TH, then our thermal efficiency can, our ideal thermal efficiency can be higher. Generally, we don't have a lot of control over TC. This is where we're rejecting heat into. Normally, we just reject that heat into the environment or like a, a cold body of water. We can't really make it any colder than what the atmosphere gives us. So we don't have a lot of control over TC, but we do have control over TH. The way we have control over TH is we can burn a different fuel, maybe, a fuel that burns hotter, for example. If you had a, a solar power plant, you could concentrate the sunshine a bit more and make the spot where the sun is concentrated hotter. So we do have some control over TH. We can just try to use different fuels or configure it a little differently to make it hotter. So that's where we have some control over and we'll talk more about the implications of that in the next lecture. It's of interest to compare our ranking cycle to the Carnot cycle. We haven't really spent hardly any time in lecture talking about a Carnot cycle, although I did have it in my notes and it, it was in your reading. A classic Carnot cycle is shown on a TS diagram down below here. In a Carnot cycle, what happens is the heat coming in through the boiler, it just goes from point A to, to 1, so from saturated liquid to a saturated vapor. Then you go through the turbine isentropically because it's, it's an, a Carnot cycle is a perfect cycle. There are no irreversibilities in it. So then we go to 2S, and then we go through the condenser here to point 3C, the C meaning Carnot. And then 3C through the pump, we go back up to point A. So it looks like a square or a rectangle on a TS diagram for a Carnot cycle. It's, again, the ideal cycle. It's even better than an ideal ranking cycle. And the reason for that is because if we think about the thermal efficiency, for a Carnot cycle, the temperature at which we're adding in the heat is right here. This is our TH. This is our TC down here. So for a Carnot cycle, you can see that it's TH. But for a ranking cycle, we're adding heat, remember, 
over this whole distance from 4s to 0.1. And so the average temperature for a ranking cycle is somewhere down here. Let's call it th average. Because the temperature as you go from 4s to a in a ranking cycle is lower than th. So we're adding heat in this part of the, the cycle and it's, it's lower than th. So the average temperature for an ideal ranking cycle, the average th, is actually lower than it is for a Carnot cycle. So the thermal efficiency for a Carnot cycle will actually be higher than even an ideal ranking cycle because of that average temperature difference. The TC is still the same between a Carnot cycle and an ideal ranking cycle. So a Carnot cycle is the best you're ever going to get of any cycle. It's even better than an ideal ranking cycle and it has to do with the TH between the two cycles. Okay, hopefully you understand that. We can, as we saw up here, if we can increase TH for the, I, for the uh, ranking cycle, we could try to increase our thermal efficiency. Some ways we can do that is we could increase the boiler pressure. So what that means is we could move to a different isobar. Maybe if we could move up to this isobar, for example, we would have a higher average temperature, right, when we're adding the heat. So that's one way to do it. Unfortunately, increasing the boiler pressure causes other engineering challenges. It means your piping network and all that has to be more robust and it just costs more to build and maintain. So that's not as desirable. Another way we could do it is we could just move our point one a little bit further up this way. Let's call it point one prime. And so then if we move into the superheated vapor region, then our average temperature that we're adding heat over in the boiler goes up a little bit more because we've we've moved up into the superheated vapor region along the same isobar. So then our average TH goes up and then our ideal thermal efficiency could go up. And that's going up to 0.1 prime is called a ranking cycle with superheat and we'll talk about that in the next lecture. There's some other things we can do as well but I'll save those for the next lecture. I think I mentioned this already, point C here, the lowest possible condenser temperature and pressure corresponds to just larger than the conditions of the surroundings. So we can't get any colder than the surroundings. Just keep in mind that in order to have heat transfer to the surroundings, our condenser has to be slightly higher in temperature than the surroundings so we have some heat transfer. So in other words, what I'm saying is that this is our condenser. The temperature at the condenser Let's say we're just ejecting heat out into the surroundings here. The T of the surroundings has to be slightly lower, at least, than the T of the condenser in order to get that heat transfer to occur, right? Because you need a temperature difference to drive heat transfer. So we'll never get colder than the surroundings. Our TC will always just be, at best, the temperature of the surroundings and actually just a little bit higher than that. And that just, again, reinforces the fact that the only thing we really have control over is TH. We don't have much control over TC. I think that's it for our lecture. We'll go ahead and focus on some examples now.